Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. The Dog and the Sparrow A shepherd's dog had a master who took no care of him, but often let him suffer the greatest hunger. At last he could bear it no longer, so he took to his heels, and off he ran in a very sad and sorrowful mood. On the road he met a sparrow that said to him, Why are you so sad, my friend? Because, said the dog, I am very, very hungry, and have nothing to eat. If that be all, answered the sparrow, Come with me into the next town, and I will soon find you plenty of food. So on they went together into the town, and as they passed by a butcher's shop, the sparrow said to the dog, Stand there a little while till I peck you down a piece of meat. So the sparrow perched upon the shelf, and having first looked carefully about her to see if anyone was watching her, she pecked and scratched at a stake that lay upon the edge of the shelf, till at last down it fell. Then the dog snapped it up, and scrambled away with it into a corner where he soon ate it all up. Well, said the sparrow, you shall have some more if you will, so come with me to the next shop, and I will peck you down another steak. When the dog had eaten this too, the sparrow said to him, Well, my good friend, have you had enough now? I have had plenty of meat, answered he, but I should like to have a piece of bread to eat after it. Come with me then, said the sparrow, and you shall soon have that too. So she took him to a baker's shop, and pecked at two rolls that lay in the window, till they fell down, and as the dog still wished for more, she took him to another shop and pecked down some more for him. When that was eaten, the sparrow asked him whether he had had enough now. Yes, said he, and now let us take a walk a little way out of the town. So they both went out upon the high road, but as the weather was warm, they had not gone far before the dog said, I am very much tired. I should like to take a nap. Very well, answered the sparrow, do so, and in the meantime I will perch upon that bush. So the dog stretched himself out on the road, and fell fast asleep. Whilst he slept, there came by a carter with a cart drawn by three horses, and loaded with two casks of wine. The sparrow, seeing that the carter did not turn out of the way, but would go on in the track in which the dog lay, so as to drive over him, called out, Stop! Stop! Mr. Carter, or it shall be the worse for you. But the carter, grumbling to himself, You make it the worse for me, indeed. What can you do? Cracked his whip, and drove his cart over the poor dog, so that the wheels crushed him to death. There, cried the sparrow, Thou cruel villain, thou hast killed my friend the dog. Now mind what I say. This deed of thine shall cost thee all thou art worth. Dear worst, and welcome, said the brute, what harm can you do me, and passed on. But the sparrow crept under the tilt of the cart, and pecked at the bung of one of the casks till she loosened it, and then all the wine ran out, without the carter seeing it. At last he looked round, and saw that the cart was dripping, and the cask quite empty. What an unlucky wretch I am, cried he. Not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow as she alighted upon the head of one of the horses, and pecked at him till he reared up and kicked. When the carter saw this, he drew out his hatchet and aimed a blow at the sparrow, meaning to kill her, but she flew away, and the blow fell upon the poor horse's head with such force, that he fell down dead. Unlucky wretch that I am, cried he. Not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow. And as the carter went on with the other two horses, she again crept under the tilt of the cart and pecked out the bung of the second cask, so that all the wine ran out. When the carter saw this, he again cried out, Miserable wretch that I am! But the sparrow answered, Not wretch enough yet, and perched on the head of the second horse, and pecked at him too. The carter ran up and struck at her again with his hatchet, but away she flew, and the blow fell upon the second horse and killed him on the spot. Unlucky wretch that I am, said he, not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow, and perching upon the third horse, she began to peck him too. The carter was mad with fury, 
and without looking about him, or caring what he was about, struck again at the sparrow, but killed his third horse as he done the other two. Alas! Miserable wretch that I am, cried he. Not wretch enough yet, answered the sparrow as she flew away. Now will I plague and punish thee at thy own house. The carter was forced at last to leave his cart behind him, and to go home overflowing with rage and vexation. Alas, said he to his wife, what ill luck has befallen me, my wine is all spilt, and my horses all three dead. Alas, husband, replied she, and a wicked bird has come into the house, and has brought with her all the birds in the world, I am sure, and they have fallen upon our corn in the loft, and are eating it up at such a rate. Away ran the husband upstairs, and saw thousands of birds sitting upon the floor eating up his corn, with the sparrow in the midst of them. Unlucky wretch that I am, cried the carter, for he saw that the corn was almost all gone. Not wretch enough yet, said the sparrow, thy cruelty shall cost thee thy life yet, and away she flew. The carter seeing that he had thus lost all that he had, went down into his kitchen, and was still not sorry for what he had done, but sat himself angrily and sulkily in the chimney corner. But the sparrow sat on the outside of the window, and cried Carter, Thy cruelty shall cost thee thy life. With that he jumped up in a rage, seized his hatchet, and threw it at the sparrow, but it missed her, and only broke the window. The sparrow now hopped in, perched upon the window seat, and cried Carter, it shall cost thee thy life. Then he became mad and blind with rage, and struck the window seat with such force that he cleft it in two, and as the sparrow flew from place to place, the carter and his wife were so furious, that they broke all their furniture, glasses, chairs, benches, the table, and at last the walls, without touching the bird at all. In the end, however, they caught her, and the wife said, Shall I kill her at once? No, cried he, that is letting her off too easily. She shall die a much more cruel death. I will eat her. But the sparrow began to flutter about, and stretch out her neck and cried, Carter, it shall cost thee thy life yet. With that he could wait no longer. So he gave his wife the hatchet, and cried, Wife, strike at the bird and kill her in my hand. And the wife struck. But she missed her aim, and hit her husband on the head so that he fell down dead and the sparrow flew quietly home to her nest. The Twelve Dancing Princesses There was a king who had twelve beautiful daughters. They slept in twelve beds all in one room, and when they went to bed, the doors were shut and locked up. But every morning their shoes were found to be quite worn through as if they had been danced in all night, and yet nobody could find out how it happened, or where they had been. Then the king made it known to all the land, that if any person could discover the secret, and find out where it was that the princesses danced in the night, he should have the one he liked best for his wife, and should be king after his death. But whoever tried and did not succeed, after three days and nights, should be put to death. A king's son soon came. He was well entertained, and in the evening was taken to the chamber next to the one where the princesses lay in their twelve beds. There he was to sit and watch where they went to dance, and, in order that nothing might pass without his hearing it, the door of his chamber was left open. But the king's son soon fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning he found that the princesses had all been dancing, for the soles of their shoes were full of holes. The same thing happened the second and third night, so the king ordered his head to be cut off. After him came several others, but they had all the same luck and all lost their lives in the same manner. Now it chanced that an old soldier, who had been wounded in battle and could fight no longer, passed through the country where this king reigned, and as he was traveling through a wood, he met an old woman, who asked him where he was going. I hardly know where I am going, or what I had better do, said the soldier, but I think I should like very well to find out where it is that the princesses dance, and then in time I might be a king. Well, said the old dame, that is no very hard task. Only take care not to drink any of the wine which one of the princesses will bring to you in the evening, and as soon as she leaves you pretend to be fast asleep. Then she gave him a cloak, and said, As soon as you put that on you will become invisible, and you will then be able to follow the princesses wherever they go. 
When the soldier heard all this good counsel, he determined to try his luck. So he went to the king and said he was willing to undertake the task. He was as well received as the others had been, and the king ordered fine royal robes to be given him, and when the evening came he was led to the outer chamber. Just as he was going to lie down, the eldest of the princesses brought him a cup of wine, but the soldier threw it all away secretly, taking care not to drink a drop. Then he laid himself down on his bed, and in a little while began to snore very loud as if he was fast asleep. When the twelve princesses heard this they laughed heartily, and the eldest said, This fellow too might have done a wiser thing than lose his life in this way. Then they rose up and opened their drawers and boxes, and took out all their fine clothes, and dressed themselves at the glass, and skipped about as if they were eager to begin dancing. But the youngest said, I don't know how it is. While you are so happy I feel very uneasy. I am sure some mischance will befall us. You simpleton, said the eldest, you are always afraid. Have you forgotten how many king's sons have already watched in vain? And as for this soldier, even if I had not given him his sleeping draught, he would have slept soundly enough. When they were all ready, they went and looked at the soldier. But he snored on, and did not stir hand or foot, so they thought they were quite safe. And the eldest went up to her own bed and clapped her hands, and the bed sank into the floor and a trapdoor flew open. The soldier saw them going down through the trapdoor one after another, the eldest leading the way, and thinking he had no time to lose, he jumped up, put on the cloak which the old woman had given him, and followed them. But in the middle of the stairs he trod on the gown of the youngest princess, and she cried out to her sisters, All is not right. Someone took hold of my gown. You silly creature, said the eldest, it is nothing but a nail in the wall. Then down they all went, and at the bottom they found themselves in a most delightful grove of trees, and the leaves were all of silver, and glittered and sparkled beautifully. The soldier wished to take away some token of the place, so he broke off a little branch, and there came a loud noise from the tree. Then the youngest daughter said again, I am sure all is not right, did not you hear that noise? That never happened before. But the eldest said, It is only our princes, who are shouting for joy at our approach. Then they came to another grove of trees, where all the leaves were of gold, and afterwards to a third, where the leaves were all glittering diamonds. And the soldier broke a branch from each, and every time there was a loud noise, which made the youngest sister tremble with fear. But the eldest still said, It was only the princes, who were crying for joy. So they went on till they came to a great lake, and at the side of the lake there lay twelve little boats, with twelve handsome princes in them, who seemed to be waiting there for the princesses. One of the princesses went into each boat, and the soldier stepped into the same boat with the youngest. As they were rowing over the lake, the prince who was in the boat with the youngest princess and the soldier said, I do not know why it is, but though I am rowing with all my might we do not get on so fast as usual and I am quite tired. The boat seems very heavy today. It is only the heat of the weather, said the princess. I feel it very warm too. On the other side of the lake stood a fine illuminated castle, from which came the merry music of horns and trumpets. There they all landed, and went into the castle, and each prince danced with his princess, and the soldier, who was all the time invisible, danced with them too, and when any of the princesses had a cup of wine set by her, he drank it all up, so that when she put the cup to her mouth it was empty. At this, too, the youngest sister was terribly frightened, but the eldest always silenced her. They danced until three o'clock in the morning, and then all their shoes were worn out, so that they were obliged to leave off. The princes rowed them back again over the lake, but this time the soldier placed himself in the boat with the eldest princess, and on the opposite shore they took leave of each other the princesses promising to come again the next night. When they came to the stairs, the soldier ran on before the princesses, and laid himself down, and as the twelve sisters slowly came up very much tired, they heard him snoring in his bed, so they said, Now all is quite safe. Then they undressed themselves, put away their fine clothes, pulled off their shoes, and went to bed. In the morning the soldier said nothing about what had happened, but determined to see more of this strange adventure, and went again the second and third night, 
and everything happened just as before. The princesses danced each time till their shoes were worn to pieces, and then returned home. However, on the third night the soldier carried away one of the golden cups as a token of where he had been. As soon as the time came when he was to declare the secret, he was taken before the king with the three branches and the golden cup, and the twelve princesses stood listening behind the door to hear what he would say. And when the king asked him, Where do my twelve daughters dance at night? He answered, With twelve princes in a castle underground. And then he told the king all that had happened, and showed him the three branches and the golden cup which he had brought with him. Then the king called for the princesses, and asked them whether what the soldier said was true, and when they saw that they were discovered, and that it was of no use to deny what had happened, they confessed it all. And the king asked the soldier which of them he would choose for his wife, and he answered, I am not very young, so I will have the eldest. And they were married that very day, and the soldier was chosen to be the king's heir. The Fisherman and His Wife There was once a fisherman who lived with his wife in a pigsty close by the seaside. The fisherman used to go out all day long a-fishing, and one day, as he sat on the shore with his rod, looking at the sparkling waves and watching his line, all on a sudden his float was dragged away deep into the water, and in drawing it up he pulled out a great fish. But the fish said, Pray let me live. I am not a real fish. I am an enchanted prince. Put me in the water again, and let me go. Oh, ho, said the man, you need not make so many words about the matter. I will have nothing to do with a fish that can talk, so swim away, sir, as soon as you please. Then he put him back into the water, and the fish darted straight down to the bottom, and left a long streak of blood behind him on the wave. When the fisherman went home to his wife in the pigsty, he told her how he had caught a great fish, and how it had told him it was an enchanted prince, and how, on hearing it speak, he had let it go again. Did not you ask it for anything? said the wife. We live very wretchedly here, in this nasty dirty pigsty. Do go back and tell the fish we want a snug little cottage. The fisherman did not much like the business. However, he went to the seashore and when he came back there the water looked all yellow and green. And he stood at the water's edge and said, O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebil will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. Then the fish came swimming to him, and said, Well, what is her will? What does your wife want? Ah, said the fisherman, she says that when I had caught you, I ought to have asked you for something before I let you go. She does not like living any longer in the pigsty, and wants a snug little cottage. Go home, then, said the fish. She is in the cottage already. So the man went home, and saw his wife standing at the door of a nice trim little cottage. Come in, come in, said she. Is not this much better than the filthy pigsty we had? And there was a parlor, and a bedchamber, and a kitchen, and behind the cottage there was a little garden, planted with all sorts of flowers and fruits and there was a courtyard behind, full of ducks and chickens. Ah, said the fisherman, how happily we shall live now. We will try to do so, at least, said his wife. Everything went right for a week or two, and then Dame Ilsebil said, Husband, there is not near room enough for us in this cottage. The courtyard and the garden are a great deal too small. I should like to have a large stone castle to live in. Go to the fish again, and tell him to give us a castle. Wife, said the fisherman, I don't like to go to him again, for perhaps he will be angry. We ought to be easy with this pretty cottage to live in. Nonsense, said the wife, he will do it very willingly, I know. Go along and try. The fisherman went, but his heart was very heavy, and when he came to the sea, it looked blue and gloomy, though it was very calm, and he went close to the edge of the waves, and said, O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebil will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. Well, what does she want now? said the fish. Ah, said the man, dolefully, my wife wants to live in a stone castle. Go home then, said the fish, she is standing at the gate of it already. So away went the fisherman, and found his wife standing before the gate of a great castle. See, said she, is not this grand? With that they went into the castle together, and found a great many servants there, 
and the rooms all richly furnished, and full of golden chairs and tables, and behind the castle was a garden, and around it was a park half a mile long, full of sheep, and goats, and hares, and deer, and in the courtyard were stables and cowhouses. Well, said the man, now we will live cheerful and happy in this beautiful castle for the rest of our lives. Perhaps we may, said the wife, but let us sleep upon it, before we make up our minds to that. So they went to bed. The next morning when Dame Musabil awoke it was broad daylight, and she jogged the fisherman with her elbow, and said, Get up, husband, and bestir yourself, for we must be king of all the land. Wife, wife, said the man, why should we wish to be the king? I will not be king. Then I will, said she. But wife, said the fisherman, how can you be king? The fish cannot make you a king. Husband, said she, say no more about it, but go and try. I will be king. So the man went away quite sorrowful to think that his wife should want to be king. This time the sea looked a dark gray color, and was overspread with curling waves and the ridges of foam as he cried out. O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebil will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. Well, what would she have now? said the fish. Alas, said the poor man, my wife wants to be king. Go home, said the fish, she is king already. Then the fisherman went home, and as he came close to the palace he saw a troop of soldiers, and heard the sound of drums and trumpets. And when he went in he saw his wife sitting on a throne of gold and diamonds, with a golden crown upon her head, and on each side of her stood six fair maidens, each a head taller than the other. Well, wife, said the fisherman, are you king? Yes, said she, I am king. And when he had looked at her for a long time, he said, Ah, wife, what a fine thing it is to be king. Now we shall never have anything more to wish for as long as we live. I don't know how that may be, said she, never is a long time. I am king, it is true, but I begin to be tired of that, and I think I should like to be emperor. Alas, wife, why should you wish to be emperor? said the fisherman. Husband, said she, go to the fish. I say I will be emperor. Ah, wife, replied the fisherman, the fish cannot make an emperor, I am sure, and I should not like to ask him for such a thing. I am king, said Ilsebil, and you are my slave, so go at once. So the fisherman was forced to go, and he muttered as he went along, this will come to no good, it is too much to ask, the fish will be tired at last and then we shall be sorry for what we have done. He soon came to the seashore, and the water was quite black and muddy, and a mighty whirlwind blew over the waves and rolled them about, but he went as near as he could to the water's brink, and said, O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebil will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. What would she have now? said the fish. Ah, said the fisherman, she wants to be emperor. Go home, said the fish, she is emperor already. So he went home again, and as he came near he saw his wife Ilsebil sitting on a very lofty throne made of solid gold, with a great crown on her head full two yards high, and on each side of her stood her guards and attendants in a row, each one smaller than the other, from the tallest giant down to a little dwarf no bigger than my finger. And before her stood princes, and dukes, and earls, and the fisherman went up to her and said, Wife, are you emperor? Yes, said she, I am emperor. Ah, said the man, as he gazed upon her, what a fine thing it is to be emperor. Husband, said she, why should we stop at being emperor? I will be pope next. Oh, wife, wife, said he, how can you be pope? There is but one pope at a time in Christendom. Husband, said she, I will be pope this very day. But replied the husband, the fish cannot make you pope. What nonsense, said she, if he can make an emperor, he can make a pope, go and try him. So the fisherman went. But when he came to the shore the wind was raging and the sea was tossed up and down in boiling waves, and the ships were in trouble, and rolled fearfully upon the tops of the billows. In the middle of the heavens there was a little piece of blue sky, but towards the south all was red, as if a dreadful storm was rising. At this sight the fisherman was dreadfully frightened, and he trembled so that his knees knocked together, 
But still he went down near to the shore and said, O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebel will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. What does she want now? said the fish. Ah, said the fisherman, my wife wants to be pope. Go home, said the fish, she is pope already. Then the fisherman went home, and found Ilsebel sitting on a throne that was two miles high. And she had three great crowns on her head, and around her stood all the pomp and power of the church. And on each side of her were two rows of burning lights, of all sizes, the greatest as large as the highest and biggest tower in the world, and the least no larger than a small rushlight. Wife, said the fisherman, as he looked at all this greatness, are you Pope? Yes, said she, I am Pope. Well, wife, replied he, it is a grand thing to be Pope, and now you must be easy, for you can be nothing greater. I will think about that, said the wife. Then they went to bed. But Dame Ilsebel could not sleep all night for thinking what she should be next. At last, as she was dropping asleep, morning broke, and the sun rose. Ha, thought she, as she woke up and looked at it through the window, after all I cannot prevent the sun rising. At this thought she was very angry, and wakened her husband, and said, Husband, go to the fish and tell him I must be lord of the sun and moon. The fisherman was half asleep but the thought frightened him so much that he started and fell out of bed. Alas, wife, said he, cannot you be easy with being Pope? No, said she, I am very uneasy as long as the sun and moon rise without my leave. Go to the fish at once. Then the man went shivering with fear, and as he was going down to the shore a dreadful storm arose, so that the trees and the very rocks shook, and all the heavens became black with stormy clouds, and the lightnings played, and the thunders rolled, and you might have seen in the sea great black waves swelling up like mountains with crowns of white foam upon their heads. And the fisherman crept towards the sea, and cried out, as well as he could, O man of the sea, hearken to me. My wife Ilsebel will have her own will, and hath sent me to beg a boon of thee. What does she want now? said the fish. Ah, said he, she wants to be lord of the sun and moon. Go home, said the fish, to your pigsty again. And there they live to this very day. The Willow Wren and the Bear Once in summertime the bear and the wolf were walking in the forest, and the bear heard a bird singing so beautifully that he said, Brother Wolf, what bird is it that sings so well? That is the king of birds, said the wolf, before whom we must bow down. In reality the bird was the Willow Wren. If that's the case, said the bear, I should very much like to see his royal palace. Come, take me thither. That is not done quite as you seem to think, said the wolf. You must wait until the queen comes. Soon afterwards, the queen arrived with some food in her beak, and the lord king came too, and they began to feed their young ones. The bear would have liked to go at once, but the wolf held him back by the sleeve, and said, No, you must wait until the lord and lady queen have gone away again. So they took stock of the hole where the nest lay, and trotted away. The bear, however, could not rest until he had seen the royal palace, and when a short time had passed, went to it again. The king and queen had just flown out, so he peeped in and saw five or six young ones lying there. Is that the royal palace? cried the bear. It is a wretched palace, and you are not king's children, you are disreputable children. When the young wrens heard that, they were frightfully angry, and screamed, No, that we are not. Our parents are honest people. Bear, you will have to pay for that. The bear and the wolf grew uneasy, and turned back and went into their holes. The young willow wrens, however, continued to cry and scream, and when their parents again brought food they said, We will not so much as touch one fly's leg, no, not if we were dying of hunger until you have settled whether we are respectable children or not. The bear has been here and has insulted us. Then the old king said, Be easy, he shall be punished, and he at once flew with the queen to the bear's cave, and called in, Old Growler, why have you insulted my children? You shall suffer for it. We will punish you by a bloody war. Thus war was announced to the bear, and all four-footed animals were summoned to take part in it, oxen, 
asses, cows, deer, and every other animal the earth contained. And the willow wren summoned everything which flew in the air, not only birds, large and small, but midges and hornets, bees and flies had to come. When the time came for the war to begin, the willow wren sent out spies to discover who was the enemy's commander-in-chief. The gnat, who was the most crafty, flew into the forest where the enemy was assembled, and hid herself beneath a leaf of the tree where the password was to be announced. There stood the bear, and he called the fox before him and said, Fox, you are the most cunning of all animals, you shall be general and lead us. Good, said the fox, but what signal shall we agree upon? No one knew that, so the fox said, I have a fine long bushy tail, which almost looks like a plume of red feathers. When I lift my tail up quite high, all is going well, and you must charge. But if I let it hang down, run away as fast as you can. When the gnat had heard that, she flew away again, and revealed everything, down to the minutest detail, to the willow wren. When day broke, and the battle was to begin, all the four-footed animals came running up with such a noise that the earth trembled. The willow wren with his army also came flying through the air with such a humming, and whirring, and swarming that every one was uneasy and afraid, and on both sides they advanced against each other. But the willow wren sent down the hornet, with orders to settle beneath the fox's tail, and sting with all his might. When the fox felt the first string, he started so that he lifted one leg, from pain, but he bore it, and still kept his tail high in the air. At the second sting, he was forced to put it down for a moment. At the third, he could hold out no longer, screamed, and put his tail between his legs. When the animals saw that, they thought all was lost, and began to flee, each into his hole, and the birds had won the battle. Then the king and queen flew home to their children and cried, Children, rejoice, eat and drink to your heart's content, we have won the battle. But the young wren said, We will not eat yet, the bear must come to the nest, and beg for pardon and say that we are honorable children, before we will do that. Then the willow wren flew to the bear's hole and cried, Growler, you are to come to the nest of my children, and beg their pardon, or else every rib of your body shall be broken. So the bear crept thither in the greatest fear, and begged their pardon. And now at last the young wrens were satisfied, and sat down together and ate and drank, and made merry till quite late into the night. The Frog Prince One fine evening a young princess put on her bonnet and clogs, and went out to take a walk by herself in a wood, and when she came to a cool spring of water that rose in the midst of it, she sat herself down to rest a while. Now she had a golden ball in her hand, which was her favorite plaything, and she was always tossing it up into the air, and catching it again as it fell. After a time she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell, and the ball bounded away, and rolled along upon the ground, till at last it fell down into the spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep that she could not see the bottom of it. Then she began to bewail her loss, and said, Alas! If I could only get my ball again, I would give all my fine clothes and jewels, and everything that I have in the world. Whilst she was speaking, a frog put its head out of the water and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, said she, what can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me and let me live with you and eat from off your golden plate and sleep upon your bed, I will bring you your ball again. What nonsense, thought the princess. This silly frog is talking. He can never even get out of the spring to visit me, though he may be able to get my ball for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you will bring me my ball, I will do all you ask. Then the frog put his head down, and dived deep under the water, and after a little while he came up again, with the ball in his mouth, and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw her ball, she ran to pick it up, and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand again, that she never thought of the frog, but ran home with it as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you as you said, but she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, 
Just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise. Tap, tap, plash, plash, as if something was coming up the marble staircase. And soon afterwards there was a gentle knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here. And mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool, in the greenwood shade. Then the princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. There is a nasty frog, said she, at the door, that lifted my ball for me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking that he could never get out of the spring. But there he is at the door, and he wants to come in. While she was speaking the frog knocked again at the door, and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here and mind the words that thou and I said. By the fountain cool, in the greenwood shade. Then the king said to the young princess, As you have given your word you must keep it, so go and let him in. She did so, and the frog hopped into the room, and then straight on, tap, tap, plash, plash, from the bottom of the room to the top, till he came up close to the table where the princess Saturday pray lift me upon chair, said he to the princess and let me sit next to you. As soon as she had done this, the frog said, Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat out of it. This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, Now I am tired, carry me upstairs, and put me into your bed. And the princess, though very unwilling, took him up in her hand, and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon as it was light he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. Now, then, thought the princess, at last he is gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken, for when night came again she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more, and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool, in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door the frog came in, and slept upon her pillow as before, till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince, gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. He told her that he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy, who had changed him into a frog and that he had been fated so to abide till some princess should take him out of the spring, and let him eat from her plate, and sleep upon her bed for three nights. You, said the prince, have broken his cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom, where I will marry you, and love you as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, was not long in saying yes to all this, and as they spoke a gay coach drove up, with eight beautiful horses, decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness, and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Heinrich, who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear master during his enchantment so long, and so bitterly, that his heart had well nigh burst. They then took leave of the king, and got into the coach with eight horses, and all set out, full of joy and merriment, for the prince's kingdom, which they reached safely and there they lived happily a great many years. Cat and Mouse in Partnership A certain cat had made the acquaintance of a mouse, and had said so much to her about the great love and friendship she felt for her, that at length the mouse agreed that they should live and keep house together. But we must make a provision for winter, or else we shall suffer from hunger, said the cat, and you, little mouse, cannot venture everywhere, or you will be caught in a trap some day. The good advice was followed, and a pot of fat was bought, but they did not know where to put it. At length, after much consideration, the cat said, I know no place where it will be better stored up than in the church, for no one dares take anything away from there. We will set it beneath the altar, and not touch it until we are really in need of it. So the pot was placed in safety, but it was not long before the cat had a great yearning for it and said to the mouse, 
I want to tell you something, little mouse. My cousin has brought a little son into the world, and has asked me to be godmother. He is white with brown spots, and I am to hold him over the font at the christening. Let me go out today, and you look after the house by yourself. Yes, yes, answered the mouse, by all means go, and if you get anything very good to eat, think of me. I should like a drop of sweet red christening wine myself. All this, however, was untrue. The cat had no cousin, and had not been asked to be godmother. She went straight to the church, stole to the pot of fat, began to lick at it, and licked the top of the fat off. Then she took a walk upon the roofs of the town, looked out for opportunities, and then stretched herself in the sun, and licked her lips whenever she thought of the pot of fat, and not until it was evening did she return home. Well, here you are again, said the mouse, no doubt you have had a merry day. All went off well, answered the cat. What name did they give the child? Top off, said the cat quite coolly. Top off, cried the mouse, that is a very odd and uncommon name. Is it a usual one in your family? What does that matter, said the cat, it is no worse than crumb stealer, as your godchildren are called. Before long the cat was seized by another fit of yearning. She said to the mouse, you must do me a favor, and once more manage the house for a day alone. I am again asked to be godmother, and, as the child has a white ring round its neck, I cannot refuse. The good mouse consented, but the cat crept behind the town walls to the church, and devoured half the pot of fat. Nothing ever seems so good as what one keeps to oneself, said she, and was quite satisfied with her day's work. When she went home the mouse inquired, and what was the child christened? Half done, answered the cat. Half done? What are you saying? I never heard the name in my life. I'll wager anything it is not in the calendar. The cat's mouth soon began to water for some more licking. All good things go in threes, said she. I am asked to stand godmother again. The child is quite black, only it has white paws, but with that exception, it has not a single white hair on its whole body. This only happens once every few years. You will let me go, won't you? Top off. Half done, answered the mouse. They are such odd names. They make me very thoughtful. You sit at home, said the cat, in your dark gray fur coat and long tail, and are filled with fancies. That's because you do not go out in the daytime. During the cat's absence the mouse cleaned the house and put it in order, but the greedy cat entirely emptied the pot of fat. When everything is eaten up one has some peace, said she to herself, and well filled and fat she did not return home till night. The mouse at once asked what name had been given to the third child. It will not please you more than the others, said the cat. He is called Algon. Algon, cried the mouse that is the most suspicious name of all. I have never seen it in print. All gone, what can that mean? And she shook her head, curled herself up, and lay down to sleep. From this time forth no one invited the cat to be godmother. But when the winter had come and there was no longer anything to be found outside, the mouse thought of their provision, and said, Come, cat, we will go to our pot of fat which we have stored up for ourselves. We shall enjoy that. Yes, answered the cat, you will enjoy it as much as you would enjoy sticking that dainty tongue of yours out of the window. They set out on their way, but when they arrived, the pot of fat certainly was still in its place, but it was empty. Alas, said the mouse, now I see what has happened, now it comes to light. You are a true friend. You have devoured all when you were standing godmother. First top off, then half done, then, will you hold your tongue, cried the cat, one word more and I will eat you too. All gone was already on the poor mouse's lips. Scarcely had she spoken it before the cat sprang on her, seized her, and swallowed her down. Verily, that is the way of the world. The Goose Girl The king of a great land died, and left his queen to take care of their only child. This child was a daughter, who was very beautiful, and her mother loved her dearly, and was very kind to her. And there was a good fairy too, who was fond of the princess, and helped her mother to watch over her. When she grew up, she was betrothed to a prince who lived a great way off, and as the time drew near for her to be married, she got ready to set off on her journey to his country. Then the queen her mother, 
packed up a great many costly things, jewels, and gold, and silver, trinkets, fine dresses, and in short everything that became a royal bride. And she gave her a waiting maid to ride with her, and give her into the bridegroom's hands, and each had a horse for the journey. Now the princess's horse was the fairy's gift, and it was called Falada, and could speak. When the time came for them to set out, the fairy went into her bedchamber, and took a little knife, and cut off a lock of her hair, and gave it to the princess, and said, Take care of it, dear child, for it is a charm that may be of use to you on the road. Then they all took a sorrowful leave of the princess, and she put the lock of hair into her bosom, got upon her horse, and set off on her journey to her bridegroom's kingdom. One day, as they were riding along by a brook, the princess began to feel very thirsty, and she said to her maid, Pray get down, and fetch me some water in my golden cup out of yonder brook, for I want to drink. Nay, said the maid, if you are thirsty, get off yourself, and stoop down by the water and drink, I shall not be your waiting maid any longer. Then she was so thirsty that she got down, and knelt over the little brook, and drank, for she was frightened, and dared not bring out her golden cup, and she wept and said, Alas, what will become of me? And the lock answered her, and said, Alas, alas, if thy mother knew it, sadly, sadly, would she rue it. But the princess was very gentle and meek, so she said nothing to her maid's ill behavior, but got upon her horse again. Then all rode farther on their journey, till the day grew so warm, and the sun so scorching, that the bride began to feel very thirsty again. And at last, when they came to a river, she forgot her maid's rude speech, and said, Pray get down, and fetch me some water to drink in my golden cup. But the maid answered her, and even spoke more haughtily than before, Drink if you will, but I shall not be your waiting maid. Then the princess was so thirsty that she got off her horse, and lay down, and held her head over the running stream, and cried and said, What will become of me? And the lock of hair answered her again, Alas! Alas! If thy mother knew it, sadly, sadly, would she rue it. And as she leaned down to drink, the lock of hair fell from her bosom, and floated away with the water. Now she was so frightened that she did not see it, but her maid saw it, and was very glad, for she knew the charm, and she saw that the poor bride would be in her power, now that she had lost the hair. So when the bride had done drinking, and would have got upon Falada again, the maid said, I shall ride upon Falada, and you may have my horse instead. So she was forced to give up her horse, and soon afterwards to take off her royal clothes and put on her maid's shabby ones. At last, as they drew near the end of their journey, this treacherous servant threatened to kill her mistress if she ever told anyone what had happened. But Falada saw it all, and marked it well. Then the waiting maid got upon Falada, and the real bride rode upon the other horse, and they went on in this way till at last they came to the royal court. There was great joy at their coming, and the prince flew to meet them, and lifted the maid from her horse, thinking she was the one who was to be his wife and she was led upstairs to the royal chamber. But the true princess was told to stay in the court below. Now the old king happened just then to have nothing else to do, so he amused himself by sitting at his kitchen window, looking at what was going on, and he saw her in the courtyard. As she looked very pretty, and too delicate for a waiting maid, he went up into the royal chamber to ask the bride who it was she had brought with her, that was thus left standing in the court below. I brought her with me for the sake of her company on the road, said she. Pray give the girl some work to do, that she may not be idle. The old king could not for some time think of any work for her to do, but at last he said, I have a lad who takes care of my geese, she may go and help him. Now the name of this lad, that the real bride was to help in watching the king's geese, was Kurken. But the false bride said to the prince, Dear husband, Pray do me one piece of kindness. That I will, said the prince. Then tell one of your slaughterers to cut off the head of the horse I rode upon, for it was very unruly, and plagued me sadly on the road. But the truth was, she was very much afraid lest Falada should some day or other speak, and tell all she had done to the princess. She carried her point, and the faithful Falada was killed. But when the true princess heard of it, she wept, 
and begged the man to nail up Falada's head against the large dark gate of the city, through which she had to pass every morning and evening, that there she might still see him sometimes. Then the slaughterer said he would do as she wished, and cut off the head, and nailed it up under the dark gate. Early the next morning, as she and Kirken went out through the gate, she said sorrowfully, Falada, Falada, there thou hangest. And the head answered, Bride, bride, there thou gangest. Alas! Alas! If thy mother knew it, sadly, sadly, would she rue it. Then they went out of the city, and drove the geese on. And when she came to the meadow, she sat down upon a bank there, and let down her waving locks of hair, which were all of pure silver. And when Kirkin saw it glitter in the sun, he ran up, and would have pulled some of the locks out. But she cried, Blow, breezes, blow. Let Kirkin's hat go. Blow, breezes, blow. Let him after it go. O'er hills, dales, and rocks, away be it whirled till the silvery locks are all combed and curled. Then there came a wind, so strong that it blew off Kirkin's hat, and away it flew over the hills, and he was forced to turn and run after it, till, by the time he came back, she had done combing and curling her hair, and had put it up again safe. Then he was very angry and sulky, and would not speak to her at all. But they watched the geese until it grew dark in the evening, and then drove them homewards. The next morning, as they were going through the dark gate, the poor girl looked up at Falada's head, and cried, Falada, Falada, there thou hangest. And the head answered, Bride, bride, there thou gangest. Alas! Alas! If thy mother knew it, sadly, sadly, would she rue it. Then she drove on the geese, and sat down again in the meadow, and began to comb out her hair as before, and Kirkin ran up to her, and wanted to take hold of it. But she cried out quickly, Blow, breezes, blow. Let Kirkin's hat go. Blow, breezes, blow. Let him after it go. O'er hills, dales, and rocks, away be it whirled till the silvery locks are all combed and curled. Then the wind came and blew away his hat and off it flew a great way, over the hills and far away, so that he had to run after it, and when he came back she had bound up her hair again, and all was safe. So they watched the geese till it grew dark. In the evening, after they came home, Kirken went to the old king, and said, I cannot have that strange girl to help me to keep the geese any longer. Why, said the king, because, instead of doing any good, she does nothing but tease me all day long. Then the king made him tell him what had happened. And Kirkin said, When we go in the morning through the dark gate with our flock of geese, she cries and talks with the head of a horse that hangs upon the wall, and says, Falada, Falada, there thou hangest. And the head answers, Bride, bride, there thou gangest. Alas! Alas! If thy mother knew it, sadly, sadly, would she rue it. And Kirkin went on telling the king what had happened upon the meadow where the geese fed, how his hat was blown away, and how he was forced to run after it, and to leave his flock of geese to themselves. But the old king told the boy to go out again the next day, and when morning came, he placed himself behind the dark gate, and heard how she spoke to Falada, and how Falada answered. Then he went into the field, and hid himself in a bush by the meadow's side, and he soon saw with his own eyes how they drove the flock of geese, and how, after a little time, she let down her hair that glittered in the sun. And then he heard her say, Blow, breezes, blow. Let Kirkin's hat go. Blow, breezes, blow. Let him after it go. O'er hills, dales, and rocks, away be it whirled till the silvery locks are all combed and curled. And soon came a gale of wind, and carried away Kirkin's hat, and away went Kirkin after it, while the girl went on combing and curling her hair. All this the old king saw, so he went home without being seen, and when the little goose girl came back in the evening he called her aside, and asked her why she did so, but she burst into tears, and said that I must not tell you or any man, or I shall lose my life. But the old king begged so hard, that she had no peace till she had told him all the tale, from beginning to end, word for word. And it was very lucky for her that she did so, for when she had done the king ordered royal clothes to be put upon her, 
and gazed on her with wonder, she was so beautiful. Then he called his son and told him that he had only a false bride, for that she was merely a waiting maid, while the true bride stood by. And the young king rejoiced when he saw her beauty, and heard how meek and patient she had been, and without saying anything to the false bride, the king ordered a great feast to be got ready for all his court. The bridegroom sat at the top, with the false princess on one side, and the true one on the other. But nobody knew her again, for her beauty was quite dazzling to their eyes, and she did not seem at all like the little goose girl, now that she had her brilliant dress on. When they had eaten and drank, and were very merry, the old king said he would tell them a tale. So he began, and told all the story of the princess, as if it was one that he had once heard, and he asked the true waiting maid what she thought ought to be done to anyone who would behave thus. Nothing better, said this false bride, than that she should be thrown into a cask stuck round with sharp nails, and that two white horses should be put to it, and should drag it from street to street till she was dead. Thou art she, said the old king, and as thou hast judged thyself, so shall it be done to thee. And the young king was then married to his true wife, and they reigned over the kingdom in peace and happiness all their lives. And the good fairy came to see them, and restored the faithful Falada to life again. The Adventures of Chanticleer and Partlet 1. How they went to the mountains to eat nuts the nuts are quite ripe now, said Chanticleer to his wife Partlet. Suppose we go together to the mountains, and eat as many as we can, before the squirrel takes them all away. With all my heart, said Parlette, let us go and make a holiday of it together. So they went to the mountains, and as it was a lovely day, they stayed there till the evening. Now, whether it was that they had eaten so many nuts that they could not walk, or whether they were lazy and would not, I do not know, however, they took it into their heads that it did not become them to go home on foot. So Chanticleer began to build a little carriage of nutshells, and when it was finished Partlet jumped into it and sat down, and bid Chanticleer harness himself to it and draw her home. That's a good joke, said Chanticleer. No, that will never do. I had rather by half walk home. I'll sit on the box and be coachman, if you like, but I'll not draw. While this was passing, a duck came quacking up and cried out, You thieving vagabonds! What business have you in my grounds? I'll give it you well for your insolence. And upon that she fell upon Chanticleer most lustily. But Chanticleer was no coward, and returned the duck's blows with his sharp spurs so fiercely that she soon began to cry out for mercy, which was only granted her upon condition that she would draw the carriage home for them. This she agreed to do, and Chanticleer got upon the box, and drove, crying, Now, duck, get on as fast as you can and away they went at a pretty good pace. After they had traveled along a little way, they met a needle and a pin walking together along the road, and the needle cried out, Stop, stop, and said it was so dark that they could hardly find their way, and such dirty walking they could not get on at all. He told them that he and his friend, the pin, had been at a public house a few miles off, and had sat drinking till they had forgotten how late it was. He begged therefore that the travelers would be so kind as to give them a lift in their carriage. Chanticleer observing that they were but thin fellows, and not likely to take up much room, told them they might ride, but made them promise not to dirty the wheels of the carriage in getting in, nor to tread on Partlet's toes. Late at night they arrived at an inn, and as it was bad traveling in the dark, and the ducks seemed much tired, and waddled about a good deal from one side to the other, they made up their minds to fix their quarters there. But the landlord at first was unwilling, and said his house was full, thinking they might not be very respectable company. However, they spoke civilly to him, and gave him the egg which Parlette had laid by the way, and said they would give him the duck, who was in the habit of laying one every day. So at last he let them come in, and they bespoke a handsome supper, and spent the evening very jollily. Early in the morning, before it was quite light, and when nobody was stirring in the inn, Chanticleer awakened his wife, and fetching the egg, they pecked a hole in it, ate it up, and threw the shells into the fireplace. They then went to the pin and needle, who were fast asleep, and seizing them by the heads, stuck one into the landlord's easy chair and the other into his handkerchief, 
and having done this, they crept away as softly as possible. However, the duck, who slept in the open air in the yard, heard them coming, and jumping into the brook which ran close by the inn, soon swam out of their reach. An hour or two afterwards the landlord got up, and took his handkerchief to wipe his face, but the pin ran into him and pricked him. Then he walked into the kitchen to light his pipe at the fire, but when he stirred it up the eggshells flew into his eyes, and almost blinded him. Bless me, said he, all the world seems to have a design against my head this morning, and so saying, he threw himself sulkily into his easy chair. But, oh dear! The needle ran into him, and this time the pain was not in his head. He now flew into a very great passion, and suspecting the company who had come in the night before, he went to look after them, but they were all off, so he swore that he never again would take in such a troop of vagabonds, who ate a great deal, paid no reckoning, and gave him nothing for his trouble but their apish tricks. 2. How Chanticleer and Partlet went to visit Mr. Corbs another day, Chanticleer and Partlet wished to ride out together. So Chanticleer built a handsome carriage with four red wheels, and harnessed six mice to it, and then he and Partlet got into the carriage, and away they drove. Soon afterwards a cat met them, and said, Where are you going? And Chanticleer replied, All on our way a visit to pay to Mr. Corbs, the fox, today. Then the cat said, Take me with you, Chanticleer said, With all my heart, get up behind, and be sure you do not fall off. Take care of this handsome coach of mine, nor dirty my pretty red wheels so fine. Now, mice, be ready, and wheels, run steady. For we are going a visit to pay to Mr. Corbs, the fox, today. Soon after came up a millstone, an egg, a duck, and a pin and Chanticleer gave them all leave to get into the carriage and go with them. When they arrived at Mr. Corbs's house, he was not at home, so the mice drew the carriage into the coach house, Chanticleer and Parlette flew upon a beam, the cat sat down in the fireplace, the duck got into the washing cistern, the pin stuck himself into the bed pillow, the millstone laid himself over the house door, and the egg rolled himself up in the towel. When Mr. Corbs came home, he went to the fireplace to make a fire but the cat threw all the ashes in his eyes, so he ran to the kitchen to wash himself, but there the duck splashed all the water in his face, and when he tried to wipe himself, the egg broke to pieces in the towel all over his face and eyes. Then he was very angry, and went without his supper to bed, but when he laid his head on the pillow, the pin ran into his cheek. At this he became quite furious, and jumping up, would have run out of the house. But when he came to the door, the millstone fell down on his head, and killed him on the spot. 3. How Partlet died and was buried, and how Chanticleer died of grief another day Chanticleer and Partlet agreed to go again to the mountains to eat nuts, and it was settled that all the nuts which they found should be shared equally between them. Now Partlet found a very large nut, but she said nothing about it to Chanticleer, and kept it all to herself, however, it was so big that she could not swallow it, and it stuck in her throat. Then she was in a great fright, and cried out to Chanticleer, Pray run as fast as you can, and fetch me some water, or I shall be choked. Chanticleer ran as fast as he could to the river, and said, River, give me some water, for Partlet lies in the mountain, and will be choked by a great nut. The river said, Run first to the bride, and asked her for a silken cord to draw up the water. Chanticleer ran to the bride, and said, Bride, you must give me a silken cord, for then the river will give me water, and the water I will carry to Parlet, who lies on the mountain, and will be choked by a great nut. But the bride said, Run first, and bring me my garland that is hanging on a willow in the garden. Then Chanticleer ran to the garden, and took the garland from the bough where it hung, and brought it to the bride and then the bride gave him the silken cord, and he took the silken cord to the river, and the river gave him water, and he carried the water to Parlet. But in the meantime she was choked by the great nut, and lay quite dead, and never moved any more. Then Chanticleer was very sorry, and cried bitterly, and all the beasts came and wept with him over poor Parlet. And six mice built a little hearse to carry her to her grave and when it was ready they harnessed themselves before it, and Chanticleer drove them. 
On the way they met the fox. Where are you going, Chanticleer? said he. To bury my parlet, said the other. May I go with you, said the fox. Yes, but you must get up behind, or my horses will not be able to draw you. Then the fox got up behind, and presently the wolf, the bear, the goat, and all the beasts of the wood came and climbed upon the hearse. So on they went till they came to a rapid stream. How shall we get over? said Chanticleer. Then said a straw, I will lay myself across, and you may pass over upon me. But as the mice were going over, the straw slipped away and fell into the water, and the six mice all fell in and were drowned. What was to be done? Then a large log of wood came and said, I am big enough. I will lay myself across the stream, and you shall pass over upon me. So he laid himself down, but they managed so clumsily that the log of wood fell in and was carried away by the stream. Then a stone, who saw what had happened, came up and kindly offered to help poor Chanticleer by laying himself across the stream, and this time he got safely to the other side with the hearse, and managed to get Parlet out of it. But the fox and the other mourners, who were sitting behind, were too heavy, and fell back into the water and were all carried away by the stream and drowned. Thus Chanticleer was left alone with his dead Parlet, and having dug a grave for her, he laid her in it, and made a little hillock over her. Then he sat down by the grave, and wept and mourned, till at last he died too, and so all were dead. And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.